My dear friends of Christ and Him crucified, you may remember from Shakespeare the famous speech of Mark Anthony over Caesar. He said, I will show you sweet Caesar's wounds. Poor, poor, dumb mouths, and bid them speak for me. Instead of showing you Caesar's wounds, I shall show you the wounds of Christ, who is both God and man, the only one who ever came to this earth to die and to conquer it. You and I came into the world to live. He came into the world to offer his life for us. And so he founded a new type of religion. All other religions, without exception, go from man to God. Either by contemplation or by a kind of mortification and self-denial the eightfold path of Buddha, but with our blessed Lord, religion comes from God to man. We need help, in particular in redemption from sin. Now what happened before the crucifixion is too long to tell except in symbolic language. I shall tell it to you in terms of sounds. Not often does one hear sounds like those which accompany the death of Christ. One, the smack of lips. When Judas threw his arms around the neck of our blessed Lord and blistered his lips with a kiss. Then there was also the clanking of coins when Judas took back the thirty pieces of silver, sent them rolling over the temple floor, and said, I have betrayed innocent blood. The crowing of a cock As Peter boasted the night of the Last Supper, that though others would deny our Lord, he would not. And yet our Lord said, before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. The splashing of water. When Pilate, who knew that our blessed Lord was innocent, called for a bowl of water, dipped his hands into the water and holding them aloft the water dripping from them like jewels in that morning sunlight and said, See, see, I'm innocent of the blood of this man. And finally there was one other sound. The thud of a hammer on nails. We go to Calvary and we await the seven words that our Lord spoke from the cross, almost like seven funeral dirges. And with the beginning of the sound comes his last words. A question that is worth asking in our American culture is this. Are you sick or are you a sinner? It is not very likely that you would call yourself a sinner in the modern age. 
Today people are sick. Are we going to a psychiatrist because we've committed adultery? Are we visiting a mental therapist because we're homosexual? Are we being treated by a psychologist because we've been dishonest? It used to be that we Catholics were the only ones who believed in the Immaculate Conception of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Now almost everyone in America believes he is immaculately conceived. There are no sinners. We are not responsible. We are not guilty. We may have an Oedipus complex, an Electra complex. Maybe our parents were poor. Or we were raised on gray bean milk. Or there were not sufficient playgrounds in our neighborhood. But a sinner that we could never be. Hence, in a trial of one of the presidents of the United States, it was generally admitted that he had made a mistake. There was no such thing as guilt. As a matter of fact, In the official declarations of the Presidents of the United States, from George Washington up to the present day, the word sin was used only by one President, and that was Lincoln, in 1863. In that proclamation, Lincoln said, that we have offended divine providence and are guilty of sin. No other president ever used the word sin except Eisenhower. And then he did not use it as his own. He quoted this particular speech of Abraham Lincoln. It is therefore no wonder that a great psychiatrist like Carl Menninger had written a book, Whatever Became of Sin? He said the ministers of the priest no longer talk about it. So the lawyers and the jurists picked it up and it became a crime. Then they dropped it. And psychology picked it up and it became a complex. Now, why is our blessed Lord on the cross at this particular moment? Why did he come to this earth? If you search the scriptures, you will find there was only one reason why our blessed Lord came in order to do away with sin. He took our sins upon himself as if he were guilty. All the prophecies about him, particularly Isaiah, speak of him as being made one with the transgressors, identifying himself with sinners. And how did he take sin upon himself? Well, because he's the new Adam. You see, we have received an inheritance, not of uh, intensified evil, but a weakness from the first Adam. Now, the second Adam, Christ, came, and he starts a new humanity. In order to do that, he must blot out sin. So he becomes our stand-in, our representative, 
he takes our place as if he were guilty of blasphemy, as if he were the sinner. Very much like, imagine a judge having before him his own son who committed murder and killed a boy. Now, there's no doubt whatever of the son's guilt. Well, the father judge, bound to execute justice, sentences his son to death. That is justice. Then he says to the son, now I will take your place. I will die for you. That would be mercy. But that is not the complete picture. Suppose that at the moment the son was sentenced to death, the boy that the son had murdered walked in alive. Well, the son would say, how can you condemn me of, of murder? You see, I killed this boy. See, he's alive. I'm innocent. I should be free. That's precisely the condition that we are in. We were guilty of sin when our Lord rises from the dead, takes our guilt upon himself, washes it away. We can say, see, he's alive. He's not dead. I'm free. So that's why he came. Now that is why when our Lord goes to Calvary and extends his hands to the executioners, And the rough nail is applied to the palm of his hand, from which the world's graces flow. At the very moment the blood is shed, what does he say? The high priestly prayer, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. It was addressed to the Heavenly Father. The plea was ignorance. If we knew what we were doing, for example, when we crucified the Son of God, we would never be saved. It's only the fact that we are ignorant of what we have done that brings us within the pale of the hearing of that cry. But the important point is that he spoke of forgiveness the moment he began shedding his blood. Because here we touch on a very vital word in Scripture. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without the shedding of blood. Not just good works, but the shedding of blood. Why is the shedding of blood required? Well, because sin is in the blood. It's in every alley and gateway of the body. It's in the body of the syphilitic. It's in the body of the diseased. It almost seems, therefore, if we had to get rid of sin, we have to pour it out. But there's another reason. Life had to be forfeited for our sins. And no life was more precious than God who became man, because his blood was the blood of the God-man. And therefore he paid the infinite price. We were not bought with gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ. That is how our sins are forgiven. And that is why our blessed Lord prayed. At the moment that he poured out his blood for our sinners. Now many of you have the faith. Now is the time to go to confession. Get rid of your sin. When the priest 
raised his hand in absolution over you, the blood of Christ is dripping from his fingers. We priests are hardly conscious of this great power. I think we would almost be shocked to death if we ever realized it. But that is how the sin is absolved. By this blood of Christ. So bring your sins to the confessional box. Or if you have not been blessed with the fullness of faith, there's something else that can be done. Buy a book. And by a book, I mean the crucifix. Did you know that your life has been written? The crucifix is your autobiography. Parchment is skin. Pen, the nails, the ink, his blood. There is not a single sin that we have ever committed that cannot be read in that book. Sins of pride. the head crowned with thorns, sins of avarice and dishonesty. He had to have his hand riven with steel. All the times we wandered from grace, and went away from the path and way of righteousness, he had to have his feet fastened to a cross. For all false loves, the pure side, the sins of the eyes, blood in his eyes, flies buzzing about Sins of hearing, sins of taste, sins of lust, flesh hanging from him like purple rags. Every single sin is there. And if we got into the habit of looking at that crucifix every day and thinking of those words, Father, forgive, we would come to a deeper understanding of the blood of Christ. I have in my bedroom, just opposite my bed, a very large crucifix that's over six feet high. It's the first thing that I look at every morning and the last thing that I look at every night. And in that way, I read my life. I do not need to wait for a biographer. It is already there. And one of the conditions of receiving the full pardon of our blessed Lord is that we pardon others. As he forgave our sins, we have to forgive the sins of others. Uh, one of the peak and most exalted descriptions of that that I ever read was about a Russian bishop who not very long ago was sentenced to death by the communist authorities in Russia. And his last prayer for his communist executioners was this. He said, Heavenly Father, I offer up for 
the sins of these men and for my own sins the death of your son but I also forgive my executioners as you forgive me and so on judgment day when these men stand before you the angels will ask what charge is brought against these men? There will be no one to charge them with guilt. They are already forgiven. Thomas More in his death said somewhat the same thing. With a couple of fallen priests who came to see him, he said, I will ask the good Lord to forgive you. And then you will not be accused, but we will all meet very merrily in heaven. This then is the message of the first word. You are a sinner. Now you may have mental troubles and all that. That's for the business of the psychiatrist. Believe me. There are many people today who are being treated for mental troubles that are only the superficial manifestation of moral guilt in the human soul. And until they get rid of that, they will have all the psychic effects of guilt. One of the archbishops of France, the archbishop of Paris some years ago, was preaching a sermon and he said, Years ago, some boys came into Notre Dame Cathedral and they stood outside of a confessional box and they bet one another. Who is brave enough to go in and make a mock confession? And we will give ten francs to anyone who does it. One boy said he would go in and make a mock confession. So he went in and made a mock confession. He was given a penance. Came out, he asked for the ten francs and they said, well, you haven't had your penance. You must have received one. What is your penance? So he walked up to the communion rail. He knelt before a crucifix. And he raised his fist. And he said to our Lord on the cross, You died for me, but I don't give up! He couldn't finish it. And the Archbishop concluded the sermon saying, I am that boy. One of life's great scandals is pain. Not only in ourselves, but in others. The poet has asked a rather tantalizing question about it. He said, Must all thy harvest fields be gummed with rotten death? In other words, before there can be a harvest and a crop, must there be the fertilization of death spread upon it? Thompson imagines a kind of a legendary weed called the amaranthine weed. And he asks God, is thy love an amaranthine weed that suffers no flowers to mount except its own? So pain will always be a trouble to the human mind as well as to the human body. How did our Lord look upon it? When he went into the Garden of Gethsemane on Holy Thursday night, there was an alternative presented to him. The alternative of the sword and the cup. He would now take into his hand the cup of all the world's sins to drink it. 
The word cup is used about 20 times in scripture, and only in a few instances is it used as a blessing. For example, my cup overfloweth, that's the one we always hear. But most often, the cup is filled with dregs. And our blessed Lord has before him, as it were, this cup of all the world's sin, which he will drink to its very dregs, in order that no other Redeemer would be needed. And as he abandons himself to his Father's will, coming down in this moonlit night, is a band of about 200 led by Judas. Peter takes out a sword to defend our blessed Lord. And he swings his sword rather wildly, maybe at Judas and his cohorts. But the best that he could do was to hack off the ear of the servant of the high priest. And our Lord said to Peter, Put the sword back again into its scabbard. They who take the sword will perish by the sword. Shall I not drink the cup my father gave? My father? Not Pilate? Not Herod? Not you and me, not the people. Is this the cup the loving Father gives? That's precisely the point. All pains, all trials of life pass through God's hands first before they ever come to us. Before Satan could strike Job, God reviewed the punishments that Satan would visit upon Job and said, you may touch everything except his soul. And so on our blessed Lord is saying that the pains that we have are seen and known by the Father. That was the way he looked on pain. Now when we come to Calvary, here are three crosses. Pay, pay, pay. The Roman execution was considered the cruelest punishment that could ever be visited upon man. So cruel was it that the Romans would never allow a Roman to be crucified. Cicero said Roman eyes should never even look upon a crucifixion. When our blessed Lord was about five or seven, there were 2,000 of the Jews that were crucified within 10 miles of Nazareth. So he must have seen the crucifixion in those days. And crosses were erected first. Now the cross is the symbol of pain. The most absurd thing in all the world is a cross. Just to bear a cross. Because it is composed of the vertical bar of life crossed by the horizontal bar of death. That's absurdity. It's our own will negated by other wills. No wonder Sartre said, my neighbor is hell. How are you ever going to overcome pain? There's only one way that pain can be handled, and that is by looking at this scene. For as we regard the three crosses, and particularly our blessed Lord in the middle, he took this absurd symbol of the cross, put himself upon it, and solved that enigma of life and death. And he solved it this way. He made death the condition of life. Take up your cross daily and follow me. 
Good Friday, the condition of Easter Sunday. Crown of thorns, the condition of the halo of life. Scourge body, the condition of the glorified body. You die with him, you rise with him. In other words, how did he conquer pain? He used it as a means of attaining glory. And here is the answer to those who ask, well, does God know anything about pain? Does God know what I suffer? Did God ever have a migraine headache? As if his head was crowned with thorns? Does God know anything about the wounded hands and feet that are brought into the accident wards of hospitals? Does God know anything about the starvation in India, Latin America? Did he ever go without food for two days? For three? For five? Does he know anything about thirst? Does God know anything about homelessness? Was he ever without a home? Does he know what it is to be a refugee? Flee from one country to another? Does he know what it is to be in jail? Are they the victims of scourging? Does God know any of these things? Yes. God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Now, for our disobedience, there had to be some payment made. And it's not easy to obey. Obey is a pain. If you have the right to order me, and you say to me, take three steps to your left, and I take three steps to my right instead of to my left, I disobey you. Then I say, will you forgive me? Yes, I forgive you. Then I have to put my foot down three times in pain, with the three times I put it down in disobedient egotism. So it took pain to atone for our disobedience. As our blessed Lord, therefore, hangs on the cross, here on either side of him are the called thieves. The Gospel of Luke, in the original Greek, calls them lestes. You know what they were? Guerrilla fighters. They were battling the Romans. The Romans had the, had the Jews under subjection. And these were loyal citizens of Jerusalem who did everything they could to overcome the Roman rule. And they knew about the Messiah. And they both blasphemed at the beginning. Both ridiculed our Lord. Then there's a change. And finally... One on the left interprets the goodness of God, and he believes in the Messiah. He said, if you are the Messiah, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and save us. We're almost reaching the condition in this country where we're much more interested in healing than in forgiveness. And it will be the forgiveness that will produce the real healing. And that was all he wanted. He wanted to be taken down. Why? Well, to go on with the dirty business of a guerrilla war. And the one on the other side changed his attitude. And first of all, he recognizes something that we all have to recognize in pain, that we all receive less pain than we deserve. And he said, he rebuked the other thieves, saying, we suffer justly for our sins. And he proclaimed the innocence of our Lord. This man has done no wrong. And finally, he asked for pardon. And what faith? 
that man on the right had. Here he looks at one crucified like himself, one whom he blasphemed a few minutes before, and this crown of thorns is to him a crown of glory, as purple as his royal installation, the nail is his scepter, the cross is his throne, and he's the owner of a kingdom. And he asks, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. The one on the other side asks to be taken down. This one asks to be taken up. When our Lord went to heaven, his escort was the man on the right. We may never presume. One of the thieves did not ask for pardon. We may never despair. One of them was forgiven. And watching then this drama of pain on Calvary, we not only will offer it up for our own sins, but we will recognize that though love does not kill pain, love can minimize it. If you lose your person, a poor needy person finds it, your loss is softened. Whenever I pass a hospital, and there's one hospital I pass whenever I go near the place I live, I always say a prayer for everyone in the hospital. And the tragedy to me is wasted pain. Here they are suffering in intensive care, too. There's no one they love to whom they can offer up their pains. When we love, we can endure anything. And it leads us to eternal life. There was a doctor in the southern part of this country who took care of poor Mexican mothers and children became engaged, and the young woman prepared a pre-engagement party, but the night of the party, the young doctor was called to care for a Mexican woman who was dying in childbirth. He did not go to the party, he saved the mother, and he also saved the child, and the girl broke off the engagement. When the doctor died after living in poverty, he had his office always above a a grocery store with a sign down below that his office was on the second floor. People wondered how he could ever be repaid for what he had done. And then finally they remembered. They took the sign off the grocery store at the foot of the stairs and they put it on his coffin. And everyone who saw his name plate understood what his life of pain had brought him to. Dr. Updike, upstairs. Suppose you visited a friend, and though his mother was living, he never once mentioned her name. There were no photographs of his mother about the house. When there was a party, he would never invite the mother. He never openly slighted her. He just ignored her. You would have found the mother very charming. Now, I wonder if the Lord does not look upon some of us Christians the same way. The Lord has many Christian houses scattered throughout the country. You go into his house, you never see an image of his mother. No one in the pulpit ever mentions her name. No songs are ever sung to her.
Is there shame of the mother? Why is she so ignored? Well, one of the excuses he might give is that, well, we who love the mother make too much of a fuss over her, as if one could fuss too much over the mother. But let us see how our blessed Lord looked on his mother. First of all, he made her. You and I never made our mother. Our blessed Lord, therefore, could make her the most perfect mother who ever lived. Because he pre-existed her and he thought of her from all eternity. Furthermore, when the good Lord came to this earth, he came through her portals, no one else's. And then he quickly associated her with his mission, because the gifts brought by the Magi were gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold because he was a king, incense because he was a priest, and myrrh because he would die, die for our sins. It was a terrible reminder to a mother of the mission that she had on this life. And then, when she is presented to the temple, she presents him, rather, to the temple, Simeon, the old priest, tells her that a sword is going to transfix the hearts of both. So they were united, therefore, by a sword. Just as you cannot go to a marble statue of a mother holding a babe and carve away the babe without destroying the mother. And so here both of them are made one. And then flight into Egypt. They were refugees together. Nazareth. Thirty years obedience. What greater tribute can you imagine a 30-year-old man thinking that much of his mother that up until that age he obeys her? And at the marriage feast of Cana, he tells her that she is going to be associated with him in the hour, which will be the hour of his death, and now at the cross. Here she is, at the cross with John, with Magdalene and possibly one other woman and our blessed Lord looks down from the cross and he does something with his mother that you and I cannot do because our bonds are only fleshy and we cannot surrender that which is of the flesh but John who was there is called the disciple not John so as a disciple he stands for all of us all of us who love the good Lord. We're his disciples. Mary is the called the woman. The universal mother. So he now, from the cross, says to his mother, Woman, there's your son. In other words, our blessed Lord is telling his mother, that we are all her children and to the disciple there's your mother not by a figure of speech not by a metaphor by in virtue of the pangs of childbirth she became the mother of us all why then in this day and age where there's so much made about the feminine is there nothing said about the feminine? Maybe she could teach us about liberation. Liberation is not only from something, it's for something. From without a for is meaningless. A rich man went up to a taxi driver. He said, are you free? The taxi driver said, yes. Rich man left shouting, or offer freedom. 
It was crazy unless he had a purpose. So liberation is not only from something, but for something. Now Mary can teach us for. Now there was another woman who lived at the same time as the Blessed Mother, who believed in the wrong kind of liberation. She believed, first of all, in liberation from a husband, so she could have as many men as she wanted. And that was Herodias. Secondly, she didn't believe in moral training for her children, for she taught her daughter to be a temptress. And thirdly, she hated religion because she beheaded John the Baptist. Now, that's not the kind of liberation that our Blessed Mother stood for. Notice the liberation that she stood for. What was it for? First of all, for life. Here is a young woman who is so poor, she has nothing but doves to offer at the temple. There's no housing. For a child where she's got to go to a stable. There's the shame associated with a virgin bearing a child. And with all of that poverty and all of that shame, should she have aborted? She believed in liberation for life. She believed in liberation for justice. What greater declaration of justice is there than Magnificat of Our Lady? Speaking of exalting the poor and exalting the humble, this is the liberation of justice. And then the liberation of equity. She's not only just for equality. She's beyond that. Equity. Equity handles all the cases that are beyond justice. Men have handled a just world, not handled it too well. So there was a statue and charter of Our Lady of, of Equity. And on either side of the Cathedral of Chartres were great windows. One series of windows donated by the family of Pierre de Dreux, and on the other side the windows donated by Blanche of Castile. They were rival families. And in the center sat, sat the Lady of Equity, reconciling the families. This is the liberation. And not only is she a boon for women, but she's a boon for men. In this technological age, when men are governed by utility, and by eroticism, there's need of the ideal feminine. Man says, I want a woman. He doesn't want a woman. He wants an apparatus that will relieve him. But there ought to be an ideal for men. That unpossessed that leaves possession vain. That beauty. Hers is a face whence all should copy be. Did God make replicas such as she? Just as soon as men see a fine, noble woman, then they're inspired. This is the ideal that is missing from our civilization. And this is what our blessed Lord commended and asked for from the cross. And then she's the refuge of sinners. After all, she knows what sin is. Sin is loss of God. She lost her divine son for three days. So she knows what sin is. Say the rosary every day. Love that woman. Let's restore the feminine in life. The real feminine. So that as her children we'd say, lovely lady dressed in blue, teach me how to pray. God was just your little boy. Tell me what to say. Did you lift him up sometimes? Gently on your knee? 
And did you sing to him the way mother does to me? Did you ever try telling him stories of the world and, oh, did he cry? You think he cares if I tell him things? Just little things that happen. And do angels' wings make a noise? Can he hear me if I speak low? Does he understand me now? Tell me, for you know. Lovely lady dressed in blue, teach me how to pray. God was just your little boy, and you know the way. When our blessed Lord came to this earth, the gospel says of him, he came into his own, and his own received him not. He had to be born under the floor of the earth, in a cave. One has to stoop to enter a cave, and the stoop is the stoop of humility. Now at the end of his life, he is rejected by the earth again. The trees turned against him, the trees that he made, or they gave him a cross. The bowels of the earth turned against him, for they produced a hammer and nails. The roses blushed a deeper red, for from their branches came a crown of thorns. And the earth itself would not have his feet, so they raised him above it. As heaven rejected him, or rather as earth did, so did the heavens. There was darkness over the earth now for three hours. And the sun which he had made as a symbol of himself and his death and resurrection in daily life, now hid its light, almost as if ashamed to shed itself upon the crime of deicide. Is there anyone else who could reject him? Now that the earth and the heavens had? Yes his Heavenly Father. Why should the Heavenly Father reject him? I quote reject. Because he would not leave us. Because he identified himself with sinners. And therefore the justice of the Heavenly Father saw him as one with the transgressors. And so our blessed Lord, at this moment, when nature shares his mood, it's not often that nature shares our moods. We are sad and the sun is bright and clear. But nature now shares his words as he cries out, My God, my God! Why? Why hast thou abandoned me? Notice he said God. He did not say his father. Why should the father have abandoned him as the earth rejected him? Well, because he's on this work of redemption. That's it very simply. Now many in my audience are fathers. Many a father has taken his young son to a dentist. 
And the boy had an infected tooth, and there was danger of his whole body becoming toxic. The boy dreaded going to that dentist. And when the dentist took the drill and began to give the boy pain, did the father ever seize the arm of the dentist and say, Do not do that. You're hurting my son. Or did he suffer it in order that the toxic condition might be revealed and relieved? Now that's exactly what the Heavenly Father was doing. He was allowing the Son to suffer for us that we might be reconciled again to him. Now each particular word is a expiation, a reparation for some kind of sin. This word of our blessed Lord is a reparation for atheists and fallen away. Does God know anything about atheism? Does he know what it is to be without the Father? In order that he might go through all the agonies of the human heart, in order that there might be nothing in him or our mortality, which he had not suffered and redeemed, he now willingly takes on, first of all, the pains and pangs of all forms of atheism. But notice he uses the word God. As he is atoning for atheists, there's still the undercurrent of God. Here there's the assumption that that is true even of the atheists. Scripture tells us of three kinds of atheists. First of all, what might be called the gastric atheist, whose God is their belly. That is to say, they who live only for bodily and carnal pleasures. They are atheists because their flesh extinguishes the spirit. And their lives are so foul that no light ever comes through the window of their soul. Then there is another type of atheist called the heart atheist. The psalmist says, The fool has said in his heart there is no God. That is to say, he does not wish a God. Do you think that a bank robber, when he's most intent in opening a safe, ever looks for a policeman? And those who do not wish there was a God because they would have to change their lives are not looking for God. And the third type of atheists are those who are antichrist. They believe that they believe to hate. I can remember some years ago I used to read Mass every Sunday in a church in London, and as I came out from the rectory, there was a girl standing before the communion rail addressing the congregation, and she said, I'm an atheist. I go out to Hyde Park every night and talk against God. There's too much evil in the world. That is why there is no God, and so forth. And when I came up to her, I, I said to her, I was very happy to hear you addressing the congregation and telling them that you believe in God. Well, she said, you silly fool, I don't. Well, I said, I understood you to say just the contrary. I said, do you think we'd ever have such thing in our history of a man in America as prohibition unless there was something to prohibit? Do you think we'd ever have anti-cigarette laws unless there were cigarettes? How can you be an atheist unless there's something to atheate? 
She said, I hate you. Oh, I said, now you've given the answer. That's the answer. You hate me. Our blessed Lord now had to feel all of that loneliness. Nietzsche, the one who wrote Antichrist and who went mad playing the piano, shouting against Christ, wrote to his sister saying, Do not think that we atheists do not suffer. We are in great agony because you can endure any how if you know a why. And we do not know a why. So for all the atheists in the world, yes, for Karl Marx, for Brezhnev, Albania, Russia, for our sophomores who just heard of Darwin last week, the good Lord had to suffer for them and feel all of that rejection, for they are not just so much denying God as they are dismissing God. So our Lord now feels dismissed. Then he suffered for all the fallen ways, those who have had the faith and lost it, lost it probably through pride, lost it more through the commandments, breaking the commandments, than through a denial of the creed. Their lights have gone out, and they have an entirely different suffering than the atheists. The fallen away is those who have had the faith and lost it have a deep sense of disorder. There's glass in the stomach. Things are not right. They would like to have them right. But while they are lonely and distressed and frustrated, the Lord is suffering for them. And because of this word, we never give up hope for the atheists, the agnostics, the skeptics, and the fallen aways. The hound of heaven is ever on the march. Stirring the soul, causing a discontent. No matter how much we try to lock God out, we cannot. Would it not be a great marvel of divine providence if as a prolongation of this word from our love, our Lord, from the cross, that we would someday witness the conversion of Russia? Dostoevsky, the great novelist of the last century, said that Russia would one day become infected with devils and then he asks for the Gospel of Luke. He reads the story of the young man who had the devil, and our Lord cast the devil out of the young man and drove them into the swine, and swine plunged into the sea. And Dostoevsky said, and that's my Russia, full of devils. One day the devils will be driven out of Russia, never pushed back and back and back into the sea. There, there they will be drowned. And Russia will sit at the feet of Christ and learn his gospel. Not very long ago in, in Russia, there was a play called Christ in the Morning Coat. On the stage was a simulated altar with drunken priests and drunken nuns about, the altar filled with vodka bottles. And this actor whose name was Rostovich, came out to ridicule the Beatitudes. And he began reading, Blessed are the poor, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. 
Blessed are the clean of heart, for they shall see God. And he read on and on the Gospel of Matthew. And at the end he said, I believe. At the end of the show, they never played it again. And one knows not what has actually happened to him. There are holes in the head of each and every one of us. And God's grace can get inside. Some are living in a kind of a hell, but heaven isn't far away. But hell is not very far away from heaven. Just imagine, for example, a perfect day in the springtime. Birds are singing. The lilt of the river nearby. Mountains are seen in the distance. All nature seems reflecting the divine power of the Creator. And in all of this peace, one man goes to a river, to that river where there are fish, contented because they're wet. And he takes one fish out of that water and holds it up. Where is that fish at that moment? That fish is in hell. See how close he is to heaven? Everywhere else is heaven. But he's in hell because he was made to be wet. And as that fish was made to be wet, we were meant to be with God. Then you'll be in heaven. God love you.